And today I like to talk about the subject of taking possession of a garden. And what is this what is this garden? So I'm going to introduce the message with a scripture, a prophetic scripture from, from the Old Testament, and then I'm going to try to explain uh, this scripture. And we'll start by reading in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, prophet Ezekiel, said many complicated things, but this one I think it's pretty easy. But uh, the messages of Ezekiel uh, are very enigmatic. Full of symbols, full of certain things that sometimes are hard to understand. And so we need to consult other books of the Bible uh, to understand what, what is God's message. And I, I, I pray that I do believe this is God's message for us today. And in Ezekiel 36, 33 to 37, uh, and I'm going to read on a, an old version of the Bible, it says, Thus says the Lord, the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt, and the land that was desolate shall be uh, tiled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. Before we continue, I want to uh, just emphasize that God says, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities. Okay, so just remember this word, iniquities. So let's uh, continue to read. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. So again, that there's a land that was what? Desolate. Have you ever seen a desolate land? Keep this image. How many of you have seen images of those mountains in Afghanistan where, where we have a lot of soldiers in harm's way? Have you seen those images? Yes. That dust and rocks and everything. I wonder why they're fighting for that in those places. Sometimes I, I question myself, and then I, I see pictures of beautiful uh, islands in the Caribbean and all that, and I said, that means, because where did you fight for? But, but they fight for the desolate land. And, uh, and uh, you know, but I, I wouldn't spend holidays in a desolate land. Would you like to go to the Sahara Desert for uh, holidays? I've been there for holidays. <laughs> it's interesting. But you don't want to remain there, you just pass by. You see the camels and all the, you know, the Bedouins, all those things, very picturesque, but it's not the place to stay. But God is giving this illustration and He's saying, in the day that I remove the iniquities from you, it's like the changement, the changing of a desolate land into what? Into something that looks like the garden. Of Eden. Well, I don't, I've never been in the Garden of Eden, but I think it uh, must be a beautiful place. It says, Then the nations that are left around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the rain places, replanting that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. And finally, the last verse. Thus says the Lord God, This also, uh, I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them to increase their people like a flock. So here we have a promise of God, and it seems to me uh, that it's a great promise. He promised to change a desolate land into a place that looks like the Garden of Eden. So this is a, a promise of a renewal. Fertility will be restored. That's a hard thing to do. When you have just rocks and uh, and the desolate land, it's very hard. You need to work the land in order to be fertile again. Then it says that the landscape will change. And I, I like to see a, a, a beautiful garden. I don't know about you, I love gardens. And when I see a garden, I feel at peace. I like to see a garden. And uh, if we have a garden, it means that we have someone that planned the garden and planted the garden. Are you following me? And the third thing that he's saying is that the cityscape will be also changed. We live in a beautiful city. I, I love our city of Montreal. Don't you think it's a beautiful city? Yes. I've seen beautiful cities in the world. Probably the, the, the most beautiful landscape in the city that I've seen so far is Rio de Janeiro. It's beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. You know, the, the ocean, the mountains. There's beautiful cities in the world. But there's also really ugly cities and ugly parts of cities. Have you ever been in a desolate city? In a ruined city? 
I remember traveling uh, many times to Africa during civil wars there, and, uh, and the cities were completely desolate. No power, buildings falling apart, bullet holes everywhere, destroyed buildings. Uh, and and you, we've seen images of desolate cities with catastrophes that happen in Japan, other places. In the, we, were we were mentioning Haiti today, and, and we see desolate cities that are destroyed, are ruined. But God is saying that He wants to change our lives in such a way that we will go from desolate land into a garden and from destroyed city and ruined city into a beautiful city. <coughs> and so this is God's promise for us individually and it's God's promise also for us as His people. Here in the Old Testament He was talking to Israel and, and we know by the New Testament that the church is also compared to Israel because we're God's people. So we like the garden. We, we, I prefer the garden to the desolate land. This is a, a, a garden uh, in, a, in a town where I went in my honeymoon. It's in a, pla a place called Madeira Island, right in the middle of the Atlantic. Very beautiful. There's beautiful gardens there. There's uh, uh, a variety of flowers that's unbelievable, unbelievable in that island because of the climate. So we see uh, tropical um, uh, plants mixed with European and, and they can have uh, uh, different uh, flowers and bushes and trees from all over the world. And it's so beautiful when we see a tree garden. So this is what God wants to do in our lives. That's the image that He's giving, uh, 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 giving to us. But the, the condition for the change was on the first verse we read. God says, when I remove the iniquity from your heart, this will happen. Seems to be a good deal. God removes something from us and then He blesses us in such a way that we go from desolate to fertile, we go from destroyed city to a beautiful city. It seems to be like a, a pretty sweet deal. What do you think? Yes. Do you desire to be a fertile garden? Do you have desire to be the kind of person that is desirable to others? You know, the world has so much need of acceptance. This is why we have, you know, kids now tattooing every part of their bodies. Because they want to be accepted by other kids. This is why so many people get trapped into a lifestyle of drugs. Even smoking uh, cigarettes starts by a problem of acceptance. Because no one that smokes a cigarette for the first time enjoys smoking. It, it, it's, it's rather, you know, uh, it's sour, it's not very good, but after you get hooked to all these things. And it all starts with the problem of acceptance. People want to be accepted. And you know what? God accepts you just as you are. Right? Even if you're a wasteland, even if, you, if your life is in shadows, if it's ruined, if everything is destroyed in your life, if your marriage is destroyed, you've lost your job, you, you, you're, you have your, your uh, uh, marriage in jeopardy, God will take you just as you are. He loves you. But He says, I want to change your life. I want to change the landscape of your life. And if you're willing to allow God to remove the iniquities out of your heart, this will happen. But the question is, what is this word, iniquity? I don't use this word every day. Well, I use it probably more often than you because I'm a pastor and I read it in the Bible. But people think, well, iniquity is sin. And today I want to explain the difference between iniquity and sin because they're not the same thing. Now, in the book of Isaiah, also in the Old Testament, explaining what, what, what is iniquity, it says, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so, so that He will not hear. And apparently it's talking about the same thing, but it's not. First, iniquities separate you from God. That's separation. And then sin causes God to look the other way. <clears throat> so you might be praying and asking God for help, but if you're living in a lifestyle of sin, it's not that God rejects you. 
but he looks the other way. His face is hidden. He will not hear what we pray. So uh, uh, I want to talk about three different aspects of the fallen nature of man. And even though you might think that iniquity and sin it's not, it's the same thing, it's not. And I'm going to try to briefly explain it today. Now, in the, in the right at the beginning of the Bible, the book of Exodus, when God was talking uh, to His people and giving them the law, the law of the Old Testament, He's talking that God is keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So, here we have the three aspects of the fallen nature of man. Iniquity, transgression, and sin. So you'll understand this. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Iniquity, transgression, and sin. Okay, so, so God wants to forgive all of these things. I know we talk a lot about sin, but I want to go a little bit deeper into this meaning, uh, these meanings. And it says, and will be no means clear of the guilt, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So iniquity, it's a generational thing. It's in our genes. It, go, it passes from father to son to grandson, from mother to son to daughter to granddaughter. Iniquity is something genetic. It goes on for three or even four generations. These are iniquities. Now, sin doesn't pass from generation to generation. Sin is personal. But iniquity is something that is in our nature. And we need to understand the differences. So there's three things. Sin, there's iniquity, there's transgression, there was sin. Now, iniquity talks about perversion. And uh, the Hebrew word for, in the Old Testament for iniquity, it's the word avon. I don't know if you sell Avon here. <laughs> if you're selling Avon products, you're selling iniquity. Just, just kidding. <laughs> iniquity, Avon. It, it's the word they use. So it was translated into English as this word iniquity. And expresses the, the, the fact that man is not holy and there's a separation between, uh, between man and God. We're not perfect. So iniquity is something deep inside our heart. It's inside us. Okay? Now, transgression or rebellion happened after God gave His law. So in the Old Testament there's a lot of laws. There's the Ten Commandments, there's other aspects of the law. And the, the meaning of, tra of transgression is to deviate from the law. It's like you're in a 60 kilometer per hour zone and you're driving at 100. What are you doing? It's a transgression. Okay, It's different from a sin. But you're doing a transgression. You're breaking the law. Overstepping the limits. And finally sin. Sin talks about missing the mark. It's so interesting the English word sin. You know the original meaning of sin in English uh, referred to archery. And you had the, the, the archers with bow and arrow, when they were practicing, they, they had a target and they will have a, an overseeing official close to the target and when they fail the, the mark, the, the, the guy will yell, SIN! SIN! <laughs> so this is the English word for sin. It's missing the target. So uh, I guess today they, they press a button in the target the target comes, you know, and, the, and you can see where, where you, you've shot. But the, the, in, in these days, they had to have a, a fellow close to the target, and uh, I guess they didn't have contact lenses those days, or glasses like, like today. So whenever they missed, the other fellow had to, to yell when, when they missed, and he would yell, sin. Now, in the original Hebrew, it's the exact same meaning, sin. It's missing the target. Okay, so God has a plan for us, and when we miss that plan, and when we fail God's plan, God's target, we're in sin. Now, why do 
I want to explain this to you? Because we all want to be that beautiful garden. We want to be that person that is accepted, successful, that is pleasant. Also as a church, we want this church to be pleasant, right? Yes. When people come to church, we want this church to be like a beautiful garden. We don't want to be a desolate land. So in everything we do, we want, we want to, to have a pleasant environment. But in order for that to happen, God has to remove the iniquity out of our hearts. And that's something that was done by God, was initiated by God, right from the beginning, right from the Garden of Eden, God had a plan to restore us again to the Garden. Now, if we have no rules, we will be like a city broken without walls, a desolate city. So we need to be very disciplined if we want really to allow God to transform our, our lives. Now, how can I uh, get rid of iniquity? Have you ever seen those ads for clear zeal or uh, proactive? How many of you have seen those? <laughs> and again, we see before and after. I don't know if you ever use these products. Uh, I, I, I never use them. Thank, thank God I never had the acne. But people that have acne, they buy anything. You know, to get rid of the acne. And if it's a teenager, they put the ad and they put this girl uh, and uh, she has lots of acne and uh, no boy wants to come near the girl and then she puts the, the solution, the, the, that mir miraculous product and right after all of the, the, the boys in the neighborhood, oh wow, what a gorgeous girl. And, or, or the opposite, they put a teenager, you know, full of acne and then he's accepted because the acne was cleansed by this miracle product. And they make sure they hook you up to the product so you keep using it because you want to be cleansed from imperfections. Now, what does this have to do with iniquity? Now, this, the, the, the acne is a visible thing. You have acne, you have acne, it's visible. Iniquity, it's not that visible. It's inside of you. But you know what? God has a scanner. God has an MRI device, a spiritual device, and He scans your life, and He looks into your heart. See, we, we can look like we're very holy, but God sees the interior of the vessel. <laughs> and, and, and we need to understand this principle. So, uh, in the book of James, it compares who we are like this, uh, like a man, it says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, goes away, and one at once forgets what he was like. We're all like this. We look in the mirror, and maybe you're a little bit overweight, or too skinny, and you're able to criticize others because they're also overweight or skinny or this or that and you forget the way you are. This isn't the natural. In the natural, we, we don't have perfect bodies. We're not in the cover of, of a magazine. No, well, maybe some of you here are, I don't know. But, but we're not that perfect. We're not ideal. So we look at ourselves in the mirror and we forget the way we are. Maybe you look at the acne in the mirror and, and then you're criticizing other person because his face is ugly or whatever. You say, what an ugly face. But you, you, you're forgetting something, you also have a face. <laughs> and there's a mirror that can show the reality of who you are. You see, James is not talking about our natural face. He's talking about spiritual things but giving this practical example. When we look into a mirror, you might say, oh, mirror, mirror on the wall. Oh. And you, you, you just love yourself. But listen, there's a special mirror. And that mirror is right here today. It's the Word of God. And when you look into the Word of God, let me tell you, there's no one holy like God is holy. Now, what do religious people do? They try to cover up their flaws 
with an artificial lifestyle that causes them to look like very holy in the eyes of others. But God has an X-ray vision. He can see through the outward appearance and He looks into the heart. See, in the time of Jesus, you know, people that were mad at Jesus were not the sinners, were the religious people. Why? Because Jesus wasn't like them. Because they, they like all the ceremonial and, you know, do all sorts of things. It's like our church, we try to make it simple. Because, why should we complicate? You know, I could grow my beard and put a funny hat <laughs> and have a big cross around my neck and come here with incense and just throw in incense and sing songs from the Middle Ages and, and, be, and uh, you could be here with all the incense and all you and the Gregorian chant and all that and say, oh, this is a holy place. But you know what? Holiness is not what we do on the outside. Now I could come here with the mirror, with pointy things, and just bless you with the mirror. You know, like a cardinal or, or, or the pope. And, and those are outward things. These are the things that people do. There's a lot of theatrical things in churches. And we also have our things as a church. But we try to make it simple. And I want to make the Word of God, the word of God very simple to you today. Iniquity is inside your heart. It cannot be removed by your actions. Only God can remove it. But you need to allow Him to remove that iniquity out of your heart. You need to desire to have that iniquity removed. What is the difference between iniquity and sin? Iniquity is on the inside, sin is on the outside. So if you, if you steal something, you appropriate something that's not yours, there's an action. You stole. It's an action. Iniquity cannot be seen. Iniquity is deep inside your heart. You know, Jesus talked about these things and He was talking to the religious people and He was telling them, you're, you're hypocrites. Because you want to clean the outside of a person. You give all this set of rules and you say, well, now you're a religious person, you cannot swear. Now you're religious, you cannot drink. Now you're religious, you need to, you know, dress in this way or that way. You cannot use earrings, you cannot uh, uh, tattoo, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. And religious people do this all the time. It's the do's and don'ts. It's a set of rules. That's the outside. That tries to, to, to deal with the problem of sin. It's a, an external behavior. Now, iniquity is on the inside. So Jesus told them, you're hypocrites because you do all these, these things and it's like cleaning a cup. And you wash the exterior of the, uh, the cup, but inside it's full of dirt. I don't know if you ever went to a restaurant and they put a dirty cup on, on the table. And you look at the cup and say, mm. no, excuse me, can you tell the guys in the kitchen that they did a bad job, <laughs> give you another cup. You understand what I'm saying? And what religion does, it's cleaning the outside of the cup, leaving dirt in the interior. And I have news for you. There's a lot of religious people in all churches. People that look like, like they're very holy on the outside. And in a church like ours, it's easy. You read the Bible, you come on Sunday, you dress up to come to church, uh, you do all sorts of, of different things, you can Bible, and you look like a Christian. But the real question is, how's your heart? How's your heart? Because God says, in the day I clean the iniquities, then something changes. Now here in James, it talks about being doers of the word. And then on verse 25 it says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. What is this law? It's God's law. You see, God's law can be uh, like a prison. Or it can be the law of liberty. To me, it's the law of liberty. I, I feel freedom in church. I feel freedom in what I do for God. Because God wants to set you free. He doesn't want to put you in bondage. But religion will put a set of rules. Oh, you can only do this, you cannot do that. You, can, you cannot say these things. You should not act that way. 
It says, no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, and he will be blessed in his doing. So when we listen to the Word of God, we can also forget the Word of God and do it in our own way. That's why we have so many different churches, so many different religions, with so many different rules. But the bottom line is that God wants to cause us to be like a beautiful garden. And you know, a man of words and not of deeds is like a garden full of weeds. <laughs> and uh, I've seen houses with gardens like this one you're seeing here at the back. Have you seen houses like with garden with the backyard like this? They should go and live in Ontario because there you pay fifty dollars a day to fight if your lawn is not cut. Any city in Ontario, the lawn is not cut. City Hall will just ring the bell, say, "Here, sir, fifty dollars, right? Cut it, or otherwise it's fifty dollars a day. It's a good law." Some people need these these things to clean up, you know, their front yard. Now, as, as Christians. We need to be a garden. When people look into your life, what do they see? Is it desirable? You see, sometimes we say, oh, let's invite people to come to church. And nobody wants to come. Why? Because they don't desire what you have. But when you live a, a real Christian life, people will tell you, there's something different in you. I want what you, you have. What happened to you? You used to, to be always sad, you used to be always angry, you used to mistreat your kids, and now something changed in your life. What's happened? Amen. And you can say, I have Jesus Christ in my life. You say, really? Are you now a religious freak? <laughs> Are you a, what happened to you? Are you one of those fanatic, Pentecostal people? I say, no. God changed my life. And when it's real change, people will see the God. People will see the garden. My last point. You need to have a tomb in your garden. What do I mean by this? You know, in John chapter 19, 41, it says, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. There was what? A garden. A garden. So Jesus was crucified in a place with an ugly name. You know the name of the place? Golgotha. And it means the mount. The mountain of, uh, of the skull, so it's a skull. <laughs> uh, so it's not a it's, a, it's a name of death. However, there was a garden right there. And so when he was crucified, it said that there was a, a tomb in which no one had yet been uh, laid. So uh, according to Christian tradition, that, that's the picture of, of the place in Israel where he was uh, uh, buried. So, but when he was crucified, there was a garden. See, God always pays attention to details. That's why the Word of God is so, so wonderful. Jesus was announced as the Messiah. You know where? First time? In the desert. There was a man, we know him by Saint Jean Baptiste. And no, he didn't drink beer. <laughs> It's not the same Saint Jean Baptiste that's celebrated in Quebec. It's another one. <laughs> because this one didn't drink wine. And I actually had a funny diet. He, he ate the grasshoppers and <laughs> all sorts of buds from the desert. And he comes from the desert and he announces the Messiah. Desert. And Jesus comes. Before he goes to the cross, he prays in the garden, Gethsemane. And then he was crucified, and where he was crucified, the Bible says there was a garden. And that garden had a tomb. Let me tell you, after we surrender our life to God, if you become a Christian, it's a wonderful life. It's not a life of rules. To be a Christian, it's not a life of rules, and oh, now you cannot drink. Oh, now you need to give 10% of your income. Oh, now you need to do... That's not Christianity. Christianity is when you come to God just as you are. And you tell God, God, remove the iniquities of my heart. And you know what happens? You were a drug addict, and now you have no desire for drugs. You used to smoke three packs a day, 
and now you don't even need a nicorette or a patch or whatever because now something happened on your inside and when Jesus said when the inside is clean then the outside looks clean also so dealing with sin is easy that's what religion does and we have all sorts of religions they do good things you know I know wonderful Jehovah Witnesses they're wonderful people you know they're, they're very civilized you know they keep away from sin but something is missing because that set of rules will keep them from sin but it doesn't remove the iniquity out of your heart I know wonderful Roman Catholic people that love God and some some they, they even chastise their bodies because they want, they, they think that by punishing themselves or doing long walks or walking on their knees and, knees and doing these sacrifices is pleasing God. It's not pleasing God. I know wonderful people from all religions, wonderful Muslims. They have wonderful lives, principles, good people, Hindus. So religion can really give you a good set of rules that will help you to be a better person. But it doesn't cause you to become like the Garden of Eden. It's not desirable. It's not desirable. I mean, if, if in order to please God, I need to cover my, my wife and I can only see her right. Or in order to please God, if I have to stop going to the movies. Or if in order to please God, I have to, to obey this set of rules. It's not very pleasant. But I have news for you. In Christ, you have freedom. Because when He removes the iniquity out of your heart, it's you who can make that decision. And when somebody comes to you with drugs, you're saying, mm, not, not anymore. I don't have more appetite for those things. It's not because the church told you, or because you're punishing yourself, or you want to show this thing in your life, but now you become a garden. Now, there's something that happened in your life. I, I once went to Bogota, Colombia. And over there, they sell genuine fake watches. So, it's not Photoshop. And uh, so, I, I bought a Rolex, Rolex for my dad, one for my uh, father-in-law. And uh, I, I bought a nice tag watch, latest model to my son. Replicas, they say. And they have the same weight, and they look exactly the same. But they're not the same. I don't know if you ever went to Canal Street in, uh, in New York. Oh, it's a, I, I like that place. <laughs> it's a weird place. And you get there, and you have these big black guys that come. They talking? <laughs> my wife and my daughter were there and they were coming, you know, Gucci, 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 this. And, and then they said, if you say okay, they take you inside these little stores and there's a fake door at the back and, and you, it's when you think they're going to kill me. <laughs> they're going to mug me and rape me and kill me. But no, they're nice people. They just take you to the back because it's illegal. And instead of paying, you know, a thousand dollars for a, a, a ladies' bag, you pay twenty bucks, if, forty to twenty bucks, if you know how to, you know, to tell them. They, they say forty. No way, you make you pay forty. And then when you walk out the door, say, oh, you can come here. Okay, okay, twenty. <laughs> and you buy a genuine, genuine fake. <laughs> I don't know if you have some of those fakes, and uh, I'm not doing uh, propaganda to any brand or anything, but there's the fake thing and there's a real one. There's fake gold, there's fake watches. Listen, there's false prophets, there's uh, false apostles, there's fake churches, false churches. And it, it, you can falsify anything, right? You can falsify money. <coughs> now if you go to the gas pump with a, with a, a bill of 100 or 50, they say no, because there's so many fake, uh, you know, 150s, it's not even safe, even from the bank they can give you a fake, a fake uh, 50s. So there's so many fake things. Now, is there fake Christians? I think there are. I know quite a lot. And maybe, maybe a few are here, I don't know. 
because they're everywhere. What is a fake Christian? A fake Christian is a person that looks like a Christian, talks like a Christian, has all the outside things of a Christian, but something very important is missing, and something very important is still there. Iniquities in the heart. You see, to fake it, you abstain from sin. Now, do you see the difference between sin and iniquity? To, if you abstain from sin, you look like the real deal. But if you allow God to remove the iniquities out, out of your heart, now that's a different thing. Now, you might not look like a Christian. You might not even dress like a preacher or like a Christian. <laughs> and people will even say, you don't look like a Christian. You don't look like a pastor. You don't look like this. Why do I need to wear a tie to look like a pastor? Or a pointy uh, hat or something? Or something in my forehead? Or do I need to grow my beard and uh, let it go in the, my hair? And now I, I look like the real thing? But if you see to God, that doesn't matter at all. God looks into your heart. And that's what makes the difference. We should be fake people, hypocrites. And God says, I will transform your life into a, into a beautiful garden, like the garden of Eden. And when you like a beautiful garden, you're desirable. People want what you have. Let me just conclude this. Now, this, this picture is from uh, Versailles. Oh, you recognize. Oh, it's Versailles. <laughs> and this was the palace of King uh, Le Duacqua. We? We Catons. I don't know if it's Catons. Tell me. Come on. On va la bête à mon bon sang. We Catons. So, so uh, this is a beautiful garden. And you know, palaces usually have gardens. And you know where the tradition started? Started in a place called Babylon. So the word paradise, it's a Persian, Persian word. I don't know if there's Persians here today, but it's a Persian word, paradise. And paradise, it, it's the, the, the garden inside the palace courts, like Versailles. It's, it's a garden, and the greatest privilege that someone could have was to walk with the king in paradise, in the garden. When Jesus Christ was being crucified, there were two thieves, one at the left and one at the right. And the Bible has this record that one of them started to curse, calling him names. And the other one, instead of cursing, said, have mercy on me. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. So Jesus used a Babylonian word and told this man, I'm telling you, Today, you will be walking with me in the garden, in paradise. Are you following me? So that's the, the word we say paradise, we, we think, well, paradise, paradise is the garden of Eden. No, 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 no. Paradise, it's, it's the garden besides the, the castle or the palace, uh, where just a, a, a very restricted, secluded group of people will be able to walk. And to walk with the king is the highest privilege that you can have. To walk in the beautiful garden. It's not a desolate place. And I, I, I'm telling you, in Babylon, it was even better than Versailles. It's one of the, they say, the seven wonders of the world. The suspended gardens of Babylon. That no one knows how they were, but they were famous. So famous that today they speak about those gardens and nobody knows how they were. But those gardens were... The name of those gardens was paradise. Now, do you want to walk with Jesus in paradise? Something has to happen. He has to remove the iniquity out of your heart. Because he will not allow trash or garbage in his garden. He will not allow fake plants. You know, when, when we lost the Olympic Games to China, I read on the news that they were spray painting the grass over there. And they painted the grass green. 
because they wanted the Olympic Committee to arrive there and to see a beautiful garden. You know, everything was fake. <laughs> you can fake anything. There's plastic flowers, there's so well uh, conceived and, and manufactured. You, 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 you hold them, these fake are real. Are you following me? Is your life for real? Because everyone around you can think, oh, that's a Christian. Oh, that person goes to my church. Oh, that person comes to the prayer meeting. Oh, he's a Christian. She's a Christian. Really? There's something that has to happen, which is fruit. You need to have fruitfulness in your life. Let me conclude with this last thought. A good message has to be concluded three or four times. So, this is my last thought. If you have a house for sale, let's say you have a house for sale, and your lawn looks like that one at the top left. You don't have many chances of selling the house. So this is why we have uh, even companies that do what it's called today, home staging. They come to your house, or if you have a good real estate, they will go to your house and they will say, okay, we're going to stage the house. Okay, all the pictures of family, all that, you know, keep it all, you know. Uh, uh, this thing, okay, let's move the sofa. Let's do uh, some changes. Why? Because they want your house to look beautiful and desirable. It's like the proactive thing. You know, is your life desirable? Is your spiritual life desirable? Because when it is, you know what God says, when your life is like a garden, when it's desirable, even church will multiply like a flock. It's going to, we're going to have great multiplication. This is why, you know, today we, we have these churches in the United States, and I, I, I love to watch those. Have you ever seen that Joe Austin in those churches? You, you, you see on TV, there's that crowd of people that say, wow, you know, 40,000 people in a church on a, in a Sunday. And, and uh, I don't think it's a bigger city than Montreal. And you look at those places, wow, what happened here? You know what happened? It's desirable. Not the church, it's not the preacher, it's the people. It's the people. Because when it multiplies like a flock, it, the flock multiplies. Not the shepherd. The shepherds are overseeing the flock and the flock multiplies. How does the flock multiply? When the iniquity is removed out of your heart. So today I hope you got the message. I hope you know by now the difference between iniquities and sin. And, uh, and also, uh, as we conclude this message, I want just to encourage you to allow God to remove the iniquities out of your heart. You cannot see them. It's not like the acting that you bear in You try, you know, to remove and cover and put makeup. It, it's something inside of you. But you know what God can see? What's going on? The devil can see, you know, the, 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 the prince of darkness can see those things. You know, you see, the, in the Bible talks about the sons of a priest, his name was uh, uh, Shiva or Siva. And, uh, and they, they saw how Paul was, uh, you know, healing people and uh, uh, casting out demons and these things. They decided to, to do the same. And it says that a, a, a demon-possessed man beat them up so badly and took off their clothes and they were bare naked running down the streets. And, uh, and that man chasing, chasing them. Why? Because they had the right words. They did the right thing. They copied Paul. But in the spirit, those demons knew this is not for real. This is not the real deal. This is not the real thing. You see, holiness starts inside of our heart. This is why Jesus also said, you know, in the, in the Old Testament says, if you commit adultery, that's a sin. But let me explain it to you. If you look at the woman, and in, just in your thoughts, you have the thought of adultery, you're already there. You see, he was talking about iniquity. Iniquity. Not sin. Sin is when you commit the adultery. But Jesus is saying, I'm a little bit a step further ahead. If it starts in your heart 
And so he mentioned whatever you put in your heart is so important. Because it's in your heart. The heart of man is like a treasure. Whatever you put inside, it will come out. Iniquities will not allow God to bless our lives. So today, instead of asking you to do a prayer to ask for the forgiveness of your sins, I'm going to go a little further. And I'm going to ask you if you want to do this prayer. See, the heart of man can be so deceiving. Even sometimes we think we're okay, we're not okay. It ever happened to you that you, you have an outburst of anger, rage, you yell at your kids, you, you beat your husband. <laughs> <laughs> happens. <laughs> Things like this happen. <laughs> you beat your wife, okay. <laughs> it's accept acceptable to beat the wife, but not. <laughs> you see, these things happen, and sometimes they're there. We don't know they're there, but they come up. And later, we think about it, and we say, I had a bad attitude. I'll better ask God for forgiveness for my attitude. You see, the attitude is the consequence of what's inside. So what I truly believe that Christianity is all about, it's all about transformation. God wants to transform your life from a desolate life. It's not desirable. I have a verse there. We are the good fragrance of Christ. And the good fragrance is made out of flowers. And flowers are cultivated in gardens. This is God's garden. You were planted here in this church to be fruitful. Be a beautiful flower, like the ones you have in your dresses, like the ones you, you put in your gardens. We don't plant weeds. They, they show there, but we don't plant them. But in order to have a beautiful garden, it's a lot of work. And in order for your life to be desirable, God today wants to remove that iniquity. Let us all stand. Our message was a very special message. And I want to invite you to do this simple prayer before we leave today. And this morning, I know that now you, re you know the difference between iniquity and sin, right? Is it easy to stop uh, a life of sin? It's not easy, but it's doable. You can do it. Iniquity, you cannot do it. God has to do it. This is how a murderer can be transformed into a man of God. This is how a prostitute can be transformed to a powerful woman of God. God keeps changing people, not by behavior transformation. That we can do. We can have a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and they can analyze you and tell you what to do and what not to do. But there's only one that can touch the innermost parts of your being. And that's God. If you allow Him. Amen. And if you say, God, remove the iniquity out of my heart. He does it. Amen. And you'll have no more desire to look into war. You'll have no more desire to buy crack cocaine. You'll have no more desire to do all those things that you know you should get rid of. And you've never been strong enough stop it on your own. But when you say, God, remove the iniquity, now you're not on your own. God does it, and He says, now I'm going to change your life from a desolate land to a beautiful garden. Amen. Now I'm going to change the landscape of your life. It's not ruined, now it's built. Now it's built and it's well built. Now it's strong and solid. It has a solid foundation. And people around you will desire what you have. Let's bow our heads and let's have this word of prayer.